Mark chapter 12, we are going to read there, Brother Mo, sorry, I forgot to tell you, 41, starting verse 41 through 44, when you find your place, go ahead and stand with me, and we'll honor the reading of God's Word. Mark chapter 12, verse 41 through 44. And Jesus sat, against, or sat over against the treasury, and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much, and there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. Now, how many of you already think I'm going to preach on tithing tonight? Don't worry, I'm not, all right? Take a deep breath. I mean, I'm sure I'll hit it a little bit. You can't preach on the widow and her mite without preaching on tithing a little bit, but that's not necessarily where I'm going. Verse 43, and he called unto him, uh, unto him his disciples, and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow had cast more in than they all, than all they which had cast into the treasury. For all they did cast it in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. And Lord, I need you tonight. Uh, my mind is going a million miles, going um, a thousand different directions. And so, God, I need you to still my mind and calm my heart, Lord, and do your work tonight. This is your word that it needs preached, Lord. Uh, uh, There's nothing I can say that will help anybody. Lord, there's nothing that I can do that will help grow your church. There's nothing I can preach that will give people encouragement or give people the zeal or the desire or the burden to do something for you. So, Lord, we need your Holy Spirit to do the work that only your Holy Spirit can do. Lord, I pray that you'd fill me right now. you cleanse me of my sin, remove me of myself. Fill me from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet, Lord, and use, uh, use um, your Holy Spirit to accomplish your will. Lord, it's not up to me. It's not for me. It's, this is your church, God. And so I pray that your message would go out to to your people. Father, I pray that you would remove our distractions and clear, and, and clear our minds of those things that we're thinking about, and just for the next few moments to think about all that you would have to think us, or for us to think about, to apply to our lives what you would have us to apply. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Mark chapter 12, verse 41 through 44. It's a very well-known story. Most, of, most, if not all of us, have heard this uh, story, this account in Scripture preached on. Um, the parallel pa- pa- passage to it, if you ever want to look at it, is in Luke chapter 21, verses 1 through 4, I believe it is. I know it's in Luke 21. It's somewhere in there. I believe it's right at the beginning of the chapter. But both accounts um, give the same story. I like Mark's account because he adds just a couple small words but but they fill in some of the blanks. Now, uh, tonight, what we're going to do is I'm going to start a small, or I don't know how long the series will go, um, on Wednesday nights of, uh, I've been going battling back and forth what to call it, but either the unnamed characters in the Bible or the unsung heroes of the Bible. Uh, this, this thought kind of started hitting me when we went back to West Virginia for Jubilee. There was a preacher there, Brian McBride, and he preached a lot, or a couple messages on unknown characters in the Bible. Some guys, or some people that showed up uh, maybe just once or some people that um, showed up without a name. But, but he preached on them and, and showed how great of an effect they actually had. And I'll tell you this, some of this spurred in my heart and mind because I'll, I'll be honest, um, and, and you all be honest with yourselves as well, uh, there's times in our life we want to be a bigger deal than we are, do we not? I mean, that, I, I am. I'm that way. Um, you, you know, as a preacher, there's oftentimes, you know, just uh, last week we had Cody Zorn, who's one of the biggest Baptist, fundamental Baptist preachers there is. I mean, his name is known in pretty much every independent Baptist church there is. And he's here and he preached a wonderful message. And oftentimes I think, man, I wish I, wish I had what he had. Now, you know, some of you are thinking, well, he, you're just saying that, so we'll come up to you, feel sorry for you, and tell you how wonderful you are. That's not why I'm saying what I'm saying, okay? I know me. I, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not, I'm not, um, gullible in that fact. I know me. But oftentimes in our flesh, we often get this feeling of, I wish I had what they had. You know, I look at Emily's pastor she grew up in, or Pastor John Smith, a wonderful preacher, has built a, a great, or God has used him to build a great work. And I wish I had what he had. I wish I could do what they did. Or, you know, maybe it's in your workplace. You have a boss, and they're, they, you know, they're just a, a natural born leader, and they have a charisma about them. And I know Priscilla thinks about that about her boss all the time, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, 
You know, or maybe it's a friend and everybody likes your friend and he's like the center of of your group and oftentimes you wish I could be like them. Or in high school, uh, there's one popular kid and you wish, oh, I wish I could be like them or I wish I could uh, think like them. You know, and as a preacher, that's how I get oftentimes. I wish I could be, I wish I could have a biggest name as they do. I wish my ministry was as big as theirs was or I wish I preached out as much as they did. And, And sometimes you have to catch yourself in these things. And so the Lord began to impress upon on my heart, my mind, and said, hey, there's some unnamed people in the Bible that did just as great of things as David, that did just as great of things as Moses, and guess what? We don't even know their name. Here was a lady. Uh, we All we know is there's four verses about this woman. We don't know her name. We don't know where she lived. We don't know the size of her house. All we know is that she was a poor widow. And yet we're still talking about her 2,000 years later. Why? Because she did something nobody else was willing to do. And so I I don't know about you, or maybe sometimes you think, oh, I wish Fellowship Baptist Church was a bigger church, or we had 1,000 people. Hey, not every church is meant to have 1,000 people. Not every church is meant to have 500 people. If that's what God wants from us, praise the Lord, then that's what I want. But you know what? Some churches, some ministries are just meant to be what they are. And oftentimes I know in my flesh we get this feeling of, oh, I wish I had that, what they had. Or, I wish I could do what they did. Or, I wish I could preach like they do. Or, I wish I could sing like they sing. But all throughout our Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, I would venture a guess that there's probably more unnamed heroes in the Bible than there are named heroes. There's more of these unsung heroes, these, 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 these people that played a small part, but what they did had such an enormous effect. You know, as I began to think about it, began to think about the heroes that we do preach about, right? David. Not everybody gets to slay the giant. Not everybody gets to split the Red Sea. Some people have to be the people in the background. Some people have to be those that are just faithfully serving God each and every day. And so here, this series, that's what this whole series is going to be about, just unnamed people in the Bible that we can learn something from. So in this story of the widow's might, again, I'm not going to try and preach on tithing. Now, if I happen to hit tithing, you just smile and nod along anyway, but Here in this passage is quite an amazing story. What you have is Jesus, his disciples, and this treasury. And so we find something. Notice number one. We'll just go right into it. I think that's the shortest introduction I've done in a long time. Number one, you have the Savior's gaze. I want you to notice the Savior's gaze. Here you find, notice, look at verse 41. And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. So what? It's the beginning of the story. What you have is you have Jesus, and here's this treasury set up. For lack of a better term, it's an offering plate. They have this offering plate set up, and the Bible says that Jesus is literally standing watching people as they give money in the offering. How would you like that? Um, Now listen, I don't know what anybody tithes, okay, except for myself. I'm the only person that I know my tithe or my my, my missions offering or regular offerings of. You say, why? Because I don't want to know what you give, all right? Because I don't want to be swayed one way or the other and think, listen, I'm human. I'm flesh and blood. I'm not going to try and stand the super spiritual Christian because you know you you would do the same thing. Listen, uh, he's not here so I can brag on him. I have a tremendous respect for a treasurer, any treasurer of any church because of what they know. All right, you know how hard it is for him to know what people give and then hear those same people that don't give anything complain about the direction of the church, right? That's hard for somebody to retain their spirituality and do that job. So I appreciate our treasure, and he, he has, somebody has to know, okay? Not, you can't have a system where nobody knows. But I don't know because I don't want to be swayed. But let me say this. This is kind of extra. This is, this is just, you don't have to pay for this one. It doesn't matter how much you give. I don't care how much you give. If you've ever thought that God needs your money to make this church go around, you, sir, and you, ma'am, are terribly mistaken. The God I serve owns a cattle on a thousand hills. The God I serve is walking on streets of gold and has gates of pearl. He doesn't need your few hundred bucks to make sure the lights stay on in this place. I don't care what you give. I don't care if you've been giving for 30 years or 40 years or if you give triple as much as somebody else gives. It does not matter. God does not need us. Now, that was just extra. That was my little spiel on giving, all right? Now, notice what happens. And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld, what's that word? How? 
that's an interesting one. Luke doesn't have that word. That's why I picked the Gospel of Mark. Luke doesn't share this one little word. Gives you so much. And so how would you... Let, let, how would you like, you know, I remember the story, somebody was telling the story of your uncle, Brother Emmett, you know, he would, uh, the offering plate would go by, and if somebody didn't put something in, he'd go back and make you put something. How would you all like if I was the one that went, across, went, went, went around with an offering plate, and you know, I put it in front of Brother Posey, and Brother Posey looks at me, and he puts a frown on his face and puts a few dollars, and I'm like, nope, you got to do it with a smile on your face, Right? That's what was happening. Jesus was literally watching people as they were putting money in the offering plate. Now listen, Jesus can do what Jesus wants to do. I'm never going to do that because that would be very uncomfortable for you and for me. But Jesus is God. He can do what he wants. So the Bible says that he's here and he's sitting at the treasury and he's watching how the people give us, get how, how the people give their offerings. And so he's sitting there and he's watching this. Now that word how not only means your spirit in giving, but also how much you're giving and in the manner that you're giving. Now I'll say this, we as human beings often get so distracted by the outward appearance, do we not? I mean, there's certain churches I've been around, they preach more on suits and skirts than they ever have preached on the blood of Christ. Listen, I, I, I've been in, the, you've been in those churches, you've heard them. I'm not saying that uh, dressing modestly is not good or to dress right is not good. You ought to dress right and you ought to dress good um, and we ought to give our best to God but there's, there's groups of people um, and, and it's in Baptist it's in Baptist uh, denominations it's in, uh, the, you know, there's in some Pentecostal denominations, some holiness uh, denominations. They preach more on your outward appearance than they'd ever have cared about the heart but the Bible says over in 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 7, but the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance or on the height of his statute, stature because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. You realize God cares much more about your heart than he does about how much you give? You can give, you can give a thousand dollar check tonight to missions and do it with the worst attitude and you will not be blessed for it. Because God does not care about, God, as I said a minute ago, God does not care about your quantity. He does not need your money to make this place go round and round. He does not need your influence or your ability or your whatever you think you're offering. God, this is God's church, not my church. It's not your church. This is the church that Christ died and bought. So I think that maybe Christ will take care of it. Go with me over to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Here's an interesting verse. Now, as you think about this idea of giving, I don't want you just to think about money. I want you to apply it to your talents, to your treasure, to your time, to your energy, to whatever it is you do for the Lord. Notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6. But, I, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall also reap sparingly. Now, I don't believe that applies just to money. I believe that also applies to time. You say, preacher, why doesn't our church grow? Why, why isn't my Sunday school class growing? Why isn't this ministry going? Why, isn't that, why, why can't I fill my pew up with visitors? Well, how much time are you investing in inviting people out to church? How much time, how much treasure, how much talent are you investing in these things? And so Paul says, he which so is sparingly, he which, which spends a little bit of money, or he which spends a little bit of time in doing the things of God, is not going to reap much. Notice this, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, notice this, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. You say, preacher, how did Paul learn this lesson? What is Paul talking about? I believe that maybe the disciples showed up to Paul one day because he learned under Peter and, he, and he, he dealt with Peter at some, I believe that maybe Peter came to Paul and he said, Paul, I got to tell you about this one time. There was this widow that came and, he, and she cast two uh, mites in it in a treasury and in an offering. And Jesus taught us a life-changing lesson. And so Paul reads uh, what Mark wrote and what Luke wrote and hears the story from these disciples. And, Mar and, and Paul understands and he gleans the idea that God does not care about the amount of what we are giving, but he cares more about the attitude of your heart. God cares way more about your motive than he does your means. He cares more about your attitude then he cares about your amount. 
You see, we're living in a world that thinks, well, I have all this money and I give, I give X amount of dollars, so that makes me a good Christian. I, I give this, so that makes me a good Christian. No. When's the last time, let me ask you this question, when's the last time you truly sacrificed for the Lord? When's the last time you had to make, make a sacrificial decision, either whether it be with time, money, your talents? I don't know what, what that blank fills in life, but when's the last time you actually had to make a sacrifice? You know, even Brother Cody hit this when he was here on Friday night, but I know not everybody was here. He, he was preaching, he was talking about giving your best to God, not second place. He was talking about giving, giving your best. How many times have we complained about what God wants us to do? How many times, and, and listen, I've been there, you, woke, you wake up on Sunday morning and the thought crosses your mind, oh, I don't have to go to Sunday school, right? Oh, oh I don't... I could miss Sunday night this, this one week. I've got so much going on. Oh, it's Wednesday night. Work just, I mean, work was awful today. They, it wouldn't be too bad just to miss one service. Oh, God already requires so much of me. Oh, VBS, the preacher wants us to go out on VBS outreach on a Saturday morning at 945. What is he thinking? And we moan and we complain that, that we have to do something for God began to think about that, and it began to get convicted. Think about the audacity and the pride in our hearts it would take for us to look at God and say, God, I'm just too tired to serve you. God, I just, I got so much going on. I don't know if I can add this one more thing to my plate. Here was Jesus, and he was looking at the attitude of how these people were giving in the plate. And I, I'll, I'll be cautious, but I'm going to make this statement. Listen, doing a good thing with a bad motive is just as wrong as not doing the good thing. You might as well just not even do it. I, listen, I, I, being a youth pastor, I've looked at teens before, and I said, listen, if you're going to come out on outreach and knock at somebody's door with a frown on your face, I'd rather you sit at home, get right with God, and then come out later. Listen, if you're going to work at VBS with a frown on your face, sit at the house. We don't need your help. You say, preacher, that's me. No, that is Bible right there. God cares about the heart of man way more than he does your sacrifice. In Psalm 51, David said, Lord, thou desirest not sacrifice or else I would give it. He said, thou desirest a contrite heart and a right heart and a heart that wants to serve God. The audacity that a man of, that a child of God would look up at God and say, God, I just have to do it. I don't understand why I do it. Can you imagine Jesus looking down from the courts of heaven and saying, oh, I'll die for him if I have the time. I'll, I'll go to earth and die if I must. I'll hang on a cross if, if I have to. No, but Jesus looked down from the courts of heaven. And the Bible says, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How much pride do we have to have to complain and to serve God with a bitter spirit when we just need to be glad that God would think so much of us to even allow us to do something for him. Listen, I understand every moment of every day that I'm alive that there is nothing inside of me that deserves God's grace. There's nothing inside of me that deserves God to allow me to preach and allow me to be a husband and allow me to be a father. And so instead of saying, oh God, I guess I'll do it. Oh God, nobody else wants to do it. So I guess I have to. Listen, if it doesn't get done, that's fine with me. If nobody wants to serve at VBS, I'll cancel the thing. And we won't even have it. You say you would do it? If nobody wants to do it with the right heart, sure. Because God ain't going to bless it. Listen, I don't ever want to get in the place where we're just doing things because we think we have to. Oh, well, I guess we'll have VBS because every other church has VBS. Oh, I guess we'll go on outreach because that's the thing you're supposed to do. We'll have choir because if we don't, people will, will, will talk bad about us online. Oh, I guess we'll have, well, I'll teach Sunday school because I, I have to. Listen, friend, I got so convicted about that. How dare I ever think I have to do anything for God? The attitude, the perspective that we ought to have Lord, thank you for allowing me to do something for you. 
Thank you for allowing me to teach my class. Thank you for giving us a choir loft that we can stand in and sing Amazing Grace and sing How Great Thou Art and sing the old rugged cross and sing uh, Just a Little Talk with Jesus. We ought to be thankful that God's given us facilities that can house some kids. We ought to be thankful that God's given us some properties that kids can come and play games on instead of giving this, this, this bad attitude and thinking that we have to do something. No, praise God, we get to do something for the Lord. Jesus was watching how. He wanted to know their spirit. Notice, though, the surplus giving in verse 42 for, in, through 44. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. But notice this. And he called unto his disciples and said unto them, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast more in than they all which have cast in the treasury. Notice this, verse 44. And they did cast in of their what? Abundance. But she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. Here are these rich people. They had more money than they know what to do with. And they, they, they paid all their bills. They paid their house payment. They paid their cart payment. You know, they paid their, their horse payment or donkey payment, whatever it was that they were paying on. Did what they were doing. And they happened to go by the temple. And they said, oh, I got a few extra bucks in my pocket. Let me, let me give it. You know, they, they treated God like it was second place. Like, oh, I'll, I'll take care of the offering if, if I have the opportunity to do so. I wonder how many of us do that every day in our lives with God. Lord, I'll give you time if I have it at the end of the day. Lord, I'll give my missions offering if I have it at the end of the month. Lord, I'll give this if I have it. Listen, God ought to be first. God ought to be first in every area that, I, that, that, that there is. Paul thought about it this way. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his notice this, grace was not bestowed upon me, which is not in vain. But notice this, I labored more abundantly than they all. Paul, why did you labor more abundantly? Paul, why did you give your life to God? Paul, why did you, why did you press on? Why did you put God first? He said, because of the grace of God. He says, I was a sinner on my way to hell, but I thank God that Jesus showed up to me one day and he told me that I needed to repent and he told me that I needed to get right and I'm gonna serve God. Why, Paul? Because of the grace of God. Romans chapter 12, verse one. I beseech thee therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. Notice this, which is your reasonable service. Paul, why is it reasonable for us to give our bodies as a living sacrifice? He says, because of God's mercy. Listen, God's mercies are new every morning. Every morning that I live, I don't deserve to wake up. Every breath that I take, I don't deserve to breathe God's air, but I thank God that he's a merciful God. And guess what? That ought to make us want to go one more mile. That ought to make us want to reach one more soul that would make us all to go to church one more time to tell our neighbors one more time to sing one more time why because God has been good to us how dare we we we, we take that mercy and that grace and do nothing with it I like the old song there is a name I love to hear I love to sing its word it sounds like music in mine ear the sweetest Name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Notice this. Because he first loved me. Here were these men, women, families. I'll just give God a little bit extra. I have it in my pocket, so I'll give it to God. Oh, I happen to have some time, so I'll give it to God. I happen to have a talent, so I guess I'll give it to God. But then notice the sacrificial giving. Yeah, sacrificial giving. There's something i got to show you here in a second. Look at verse 43. And he called unto him his disciples and said unto them, Verily I say unto you. Actually, wait. I messed up. I didn't mess up, but I, I got to go back. I got to show you something. Mo, the picture I just showed you, would you put it up? Or I, I sent you, did you get it? Would you put that up for me? I want to show you all something. You see, my job as a pastor is to warn of false ideology. How many, anybody seen this on Facebook here lately? A couple of you have? Okay, now let me, let me preface this. If you shared this, 
I apologize. For, I'm not, I don't apologize for what I'm going to say. I'm just going to try and in a loving way share the Bible with you. I don't know if anybody in here shared it or liked it. it, it you, ever, you know, some people try to sound so profound that they actually end up not sounding all that profound. For me, this is one of those statements. Remember I just talked about that surplus giving, right? Loving, we ought to, when we're talking about the widow, Mike, you want to know why God, Jesus, talked about the widow? It was because she sacrificed everything for Christ. Christ was the most important thing in her life. And I read this the other day, and I even, I brought it, I talked to somebody, I mentioned it to somebody. The test of Christianity is not loving Jesus, it's loving Judas. Now on face value, you read that, you're like, hey, that's pretty, that's pretty neat, right? That, that sounds okay, that sounds right. Remember when Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was? Did he say to love Judas? No, you want to use the greatest commandment was? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart with all thy soul, with all thy mind. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now listen, we ought to love the Judases of the world. We ought to love every man, every woman, every boy and every girl, whether they agree with us or not. But I will tell you this, that the first priority for the Christian is to love Jesus with everything that is in us. You say, why, preacher? Because he came and he bled and he died and he rose again. That's why we love him, because he first loved us. Now, I get on my third point, sacrificial giving. Now you see this widow and her might in verse 43. Very last saying to you that this poor widow, he doesn't just say widow. He makes sure to make known that this lady was poor. That this poor widow have cast more in than they all, which have cast into the treasury. You see, when those, when those rich people were coming by and they were casting in their money and they were casting in their treasures, you know, they may have been casting in the, 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 the nice steak, and instead of getting a steak, they went and got a Big Mac, okay? Or instead of going to Starbucks, they just had coffee at home, or maybe, you know, they made some little bitty changes just to be able to give some money in the plate, or they just had extra in their pocket. But when this widow with her two mites, I want you to picture this. And I, I've been where this lady is before, and guess what? I didn't have enough faith to do with this lady. I'll, I'll be honest and admit to you, there have been times I didn't think a bill would get paid, so I paid the bill instead of giving my tithe. <gasps> Preacher, you did that, don't you even, because we've all been there. All right. If you haven't been there, you ought to thank God you've never been there. I've been there, and I didn't have this much faith. I can imagine this poor widow with her two little mites standing above that offering plate, knowing she wasn't casting in a trip to McDonald's. She wasn't casting in the nice new house or the, the best car. No, she was casting in her next meal. She was casting in that, that light bill, that gas bill, that water bill. She was casting in her house payment, her car payment, saying, Lord, this is all I have. If I cast this in, I literally have nothing. Do you realize that's what we as Christians ought to do every day of our lives? Every day, just cast it all in the treasury, in God's treasury. Say, Lord, here's my time today. It's yours. God, here's my house today. It's yours. Lord, my car today is yours. My life today is yours. My energy today is yours. My money today is yours. Lord, today and every day that I live, all that I have is yours. And here she is casting in everything. What amazes me, though, is what she gave in today's standards would be like giving pennies. You say, oh, somebody gave 25 cents in the offering. You go, big whoop. Somebody can go buy a gumball. I don't even know if you can buy gumballs for 25 cents anymore with inflation. You know, we would say big whoop. You look at that. But Jesus didn't say big whoop. I'm sure the disciples, had they saw that, would have been like, okay, so what? Two, two pennies. Who cares? You know, these, these rich people are the ones paying the bills. No, God's paying the bills. Anyways. Jesus looks at that and he says, that is real faith. That is true Christian living. Why? Because this lady, she trusted God with everything, not knowing where her next meal was going to come from, not knowing where the next, the next drink was going to come from, not knowing anything. But the Bible does say, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. As a preacher, one of the things that hurts my heart the most is to hear people say, well, preacher, I can't do much. I just can't do what I used to do. I can't give what I used to give. I can't go like I used to go. Listen, I understand 
understand that, and I, it does. It hurts my heart because I know your heart. You want to do more, and you want to be able to go, and you want to be able to give, but aren't you glad in God's economy it's not about the amount. It's about the heart in which you give it. God can do way more with a widow and her two mites than he ever can do with some rich people that think they're all that and think that they're something special. God can do so much more with a group of people that will humbly say, Lord, I don't have much, but whatever I have is yours. That's a group of people that God will look up from heaven and he'll open up the windows of heaven and he'll start blessing those people. Why? Because they reaped bountifully. Little is much when God is in it. I'm not going to sing again. I won't make your ears bleed. I love that old song, Little is Much When God is in It. This widow didn't have much. I'm reminded of that little boy with five loaves and two fishes. There wasn't much. When you place your little bit in the hands of the Almighty, He can do something great with it. Now notice lastly, the significant glorification. <laughs> notice what happens. I love this. In first, look at the first phrase of verse 43. And he called unto him and his disciples and saith unto them. You want to know what just you want to know what happened? Jesus is sitting over there with the offering plate, right? And, and this, this poor widow comes by. And she puts in her, you know, rich people had been going by all day. I mean, throwing in hundreds after hundreds after hundreds. You know, they're just taking big old wads out of their pocket and just, just slapping it in the, 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 the offering plate. And Jesus looks at it, cool, cool. Oh, great. But here comes this little widow woman. She don't have much. She don't have a big old wad of $100 bills. She don't have, you know, those nice crisps, that, that big old bank stack, you know, that's labeled 5000 or whatever it is. No, she comes with just two little pennies. And you can just kind of imagine her throwing those little pennies in there and then going clink, clink. And Jesus, God himself, stops and says, whoa. And then he calls his disciples over and says, you disciples, you 12 men, you 12 little people that think you're all that, think you're just, you know, you're, you're something special and want to sit on the right hand of God and you want to sit here and you want to reign here, you want to do this. He says, you 12, you get over here. He says, I got to teach you something. And so Jesus takes this little lesson from this widow woman and he tells his disciples, he says, you look right here. He says, you want to know what it means to be a Christian? You want to know what it means to be Christ-like? You want to know what it means to follow Christ with everything that is in you? You take a lesson from this little widow. We don't know her name. We don't know anything about her, but I like verse 44. Look at verse 44. For all they did cast in of their abundance. Again, those rich people, they just gave out of what they had, but the notice says, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her Living, but no, but go back to verse 43. We know she gave it all, right? But we know that all wasn't much in our standards, right? According to those rich people, in a, in a ratio, it would have been like one one thousandth of what the rich people gave. But look at verse 43. Verily I say unto you that this poor widow, notice this, hath cast more in than all they. Jesus had more respect for the two mites of that poor widow than he did for the hundreds and thousands of dollars that the, tre that the others threw in. Why? Because she did it out of a place of sacrifice. She did it out of a place of saying, Lord, I am trusting you with everything that I have. Literally put every, all of her eggs in one basket, so to speak, or all of her mites in one basket and said, Lord, I have nothing else. If I'm going to live tomorrow, it's only by your grace. And here's what I believe. I believe God took care of her very well. Why? Because the Bible says that if we'll seek first the kingdom of God, all these things shall be added unto you. David said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. You say, and preacher, why doesn't the Bible tell us how God blessed her. Because if God were to have tell us how he blessed her, we would preach prosperity gospel from it. I believe that this lady was probably blessed beyond imagined. We don't know that. She could have remained poor the rest of her life. We don't know. But here's what's amazing. In my mind, and I'll close with this. In our minds, we think, well, if she was poor, Jesus knew this, right? So why didn't Jesus just tell her not to do it? It would have robbed her of a blessing. Christian, how many blessings have you missed on because you're not willing to give God everything? I wonder how many times God says, I wanted to bless you. Fellowship, I wanted to give you more people. I wanted to give you more ministries. But you weren't willing to give me everything. 
Josh, how many, uh, you, how many times do I want to bless your family, but you weren't willing to give it all to me? How many times do I want to bless your ministry, but you weren't willing to give it all to me? I wonder how many blessings we've missed out on. This lady wasn't going to miss out on it. You know, the, one of the best lessons I've learned in my life, people have, and this is something that's been shared with me, is don't rob people of a blessing. If somebody wants to be a blessing to you, let them be a blessing. I know, like in my pride, in my flesh, you know, I don't want to accept those blessings all the time. And sometimes they're from people that I know are worse off than me. I, I feel bad taking their, ble- or taking their gift or taking whatever they want to give me, but then the Holy Spirit says, hey, I'm going to bless them for that. You just do what you're supposed to do. You allow them to be a blessing. So I'm going to bless them for their efforts. I'm going to bless them for their sacrifice. Christian, how many blessings have we missed out on because we haven't been willing to be like this widow? Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. God, I thank you for your message. Thank you for your word. I thank you for this widow. We don't know her name. Lord, she's an unsung hero of the Bible. Unnamed. But God, oh, what an impact she made. Very well, her story could have impacted Paul in his writings. Her story could have in, has, has been in, um, affecting churches. Ever since, that message gets preached and that widow gets thought about and people are stirred to give you more. Why? Because one lady, one unsung hero in the Bible was willing to do what nobody else was willing to do. Lord, give me the faith to sacrifice for you. Lord, just give me a burden. Give me a desire. Show me what you'd have me to do. I pray that you'll bring us back again the next appointed time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, y'all are dismissed. Thank you for being here tonight. If I could get a few guys to help me with this pulpit and this organ. Mo, I don't know if you want to get down here to this organ to mess with the chords before they start messing with them.